Today we are going to start our next unit, and that unit is photography. Today we're going to dig into the introduction to photography. What you will need, you're going to need a few things for this class, and I'm going to give them to you right here. You're going to need the PowerPoint presentation. That PowerPoint presentation is in your Google folder. You should have an invite for that, and when you get that, you can go ahead and download that and have that on your computers ready to look at in case we need it. And you'll also be able to go back and reference that later on um, when uh, writing your notes. You're also going to need the introduction to photography notes for lesson one. Those are in, also in your Google Drive. Go ahead and go in there and grab those and have those ready to go. You can either print those up and bring in a paper copy next class, or you can take notes today and fill out your Google Notes after you get home this afternoon. Um, if you do have your computers open, go ahead and bring up the Google Notes and you can take notes while we are going through class. What you're gonna learn in this class today, you are going to learn and understand the, excuse me, the historical significance of photography. We're going to go over where photography started, how it all began, and how it got from there to now, then to now. You're going to be able to identify photographic terms. Some of those terms have to do with theory that we're going to discuss today. Other of those terms have to do with components and uh, different things that the camera does in order to create an image. You're also going to understand the foundational principles of photography. We're going to talk about a couple of those today, and then tomorrow we're going to move on to talk about some more. Now, what is the most important thing to consider, most important concept when thinking about photography? Anybody? Come on, anybody? Light, that's correct. When you open your eyes, what do you see? People, images, me, <laughs> that's a good point. When we turn off the lights, it's pitch black in here. You can't see your hand in front of your face. Can you still see those things? Why not? The absence of light. There is no light, so without light we cannot see. So if you were to take a picture and there was no light, would you be able to take a picture? No, that's correct. When we talk about the history of photography and where it all began, it begins with light. Let me explain. Can anyone tell me the name of the first steel camera? Anybody? It was first known to be used by a Chinese philosopher in the mid fifth century BC, a long time ago. Camera obscura, Latin meaning dark room, and it was first used back by Mosi, a Chinese photographer during the 5th century BC. The camera obscura is the original dark room. What that means is light from an external source passes through a hole and strikes a surface inside. Once it passes through that hole, then it represents an image or presents an image on the back wall or the opposing wall of that box. That image is turned upside down and inverted, so it's upside down and backwards. But what it allows the person or the artist photographer to do is it allows them to trace that image. And it actually gives you a really, really good representation, plus it's in color. And uh, all throughout history, people have been using, scientists have been using, artists have been using the camera obscura in order to capture images realistic images and people can just draw things and create images and art from their imaginations but this allows them to create an actual representation of an image by tracing it um, from paper the first camera as you can see cameras have come a long way in the 20th century that camera up there on the top left is an old school camera. Nobody even uses that camera anymore. You know that they didn't even use digital cameras in any of these pictures. This goes all the way down to 1981. This is all film. Anybody ever used a film camera? Nobody uses film anymore. It's a, it's a, 
It is a dinosaur. I still love using film, but I don't use it anymore because it takes so much time to process. But that's okay because we have digital. Here is what the evolution of cameras from Canon looked like over the course of the 20th and the 21st century. It goes a long way back to 35 millimeter cameras on the top left to a digital EOS one down here on the bottom right. It's a wide range of cameras created by one company and camera, Canon is probably one of the most widely known um, companies out there for creating cameras. Anybody know another one? Nikon, that's correct. Can anyone tell me what company created this? This is the first digital camera. And if it looks a little chunky, that's because it is. Anyone know who created it? What company? Want to take a guess? They also created film and create film. Kodak. Made by Kodak in 1975. It was a smorgasbord of different parts collected from across the company, assembled to create what is now known as the first digital camera. It actually recorded the images on this little cassette here in which we were then able to represent those in image form uh, by developing them. A pretty ancient way of capturing images, but this is where it started. Without this, we wouldn't have anything that we have today. Now, this is an image from two different papal elections at the Vatican in Rome. The first in 2005, the second image at the, on the bottom from 2013. Can anyone tell me what they notice about those two images? What's the difference? You see a little bitty flip phone here? You see any other phones? And what do you see down here? All these glowing lights represent individual devices that capture pictures and video. We have gone from being a industry where just the most stoic professionals carry really top notch and quality equipment to where everyone carries an iPad or an iPhone or a digital camera or a cell phone that will take pictures. It's pretty remarkable and it's even changed that much more since 2013. One thing that has not changed, but it has kind of disappeared from the landscape of photography are dark rooms. Anyone tell me what dark rooms were used for or are used for? Dark rooms are used to develop film. So if you were to shoot your pictures on a film camera, you would need to process those, that film. Sure, you could take your, your film roll over to Walgreens and they can ship it off and have it processed, but somebody somewhere, not necessarily in a dark room anymore because they have machines to do it, but this would have been the way that it was done. Take a look at this. This is a dark room. This is a photographer using a dark room to process images. And you can see the image that this photographer is working on. All these images hanging up by clothespins on these lines, all these images are actually drying because these images have been soaked in multiple different solutions to be able to create them. And the way it works, this little piece right here is a telescoping lens and it has a light that shines through it. And if anybody ever heard of a negative, a film negative? So, you know, you used to get the, the developed pictures and then in that developed roll of pictures, you would get the film negatives. That's what comes out of the roll of film. It's actually a negative, complete opposite of what you see on the finished picture. And what that negative does, the light shines through that negative, okay? And they can control the amount of focus in that light and the intensity of that light. And then that light shines through the negative onto a piece of photographic paper. And what that photographic paper does is it collects that light and that negative, turning it into what you see in a photograph. Then it has to go through three different steps of solution. So three different baths. You've seen on the movies where photographers will take things and they'll put it in the water or they'll put it in the, in the solution and then they'll take it out and they'll dry it and hang it up to dry. Three different things that it has to go through in order to get from negative to an actual picture. If you want to know more about dark rooms, I'll be glad to sit down and talk with you. But 
for our purposes today, we're going to keep moving on. I love darkroom work, and I would love to, uh, to explore that, uh, that idea with you a little bit more. Now, moving on from history, and by the way, if you were not taking notes, you can go back and look at the Introduction to Photography PowerPoint slide and fill out your notes on your Google Notes because this information will be on a quiz on Monday, okay? Moving on to foundational principles for better photography. These are the concepts that I want to introduce you to to start getting a feel for what we're looking for when we're starting to take pictures and when we're learning about taking pictures. Okay. Can you recreate this image with your camera? Do you have a camera that you think you could take this picture? Maybe, maybe not, maybe not. What about this? You know it's gonna be dark. These people down here, they're pretty nicely illuminated. What are some of the things that we need to know in order to take this picture? how to actually see it, because this is a dark sky, and how do you capture an image that fast? When those fireworks explode, how are you gonna be able to catch that? And you see all those, there's a lot that goes into capturing an image like that. And what knowledge and understanding do we need to be able to take this picture? Can anybody tell me what this genre of photography is? astrophotography, taking picture, pictures of the night sky. And we're gonna move into this in a little bit, but this is when the exposure is wide open and the shutter takes an incredibly long, an incredibly long image. And it's exposed for a very long period of time. And what it does is it captures and absorbs all of that light from those stars. They're being able to allow you to pick out the little pinpricks of light that you wouldn't see with the naked eye. In this picture, what's the first thing that you notice? The sun. It's the first thing that I noticed. There's a lot of light in that picture. And it is a really, really good use of light because the light's shining through the trees, but it's not shining into the lens. And this photographer captured that picture beautifully with that light coming through those trees. And we're going to work towards learning how to capture images like this. The first thing we need to know when it comes to photography and the most important thing about photography being light is exposure. Exposure is the amount of light that the camera allows into the image sensor. And for those of you who are using film, it is the amount of light that reaches the camera film, okay? So light comes in through the camera and the amount of light that is allowed to hit the image sensor is controlled, is the, the amount is the exposure. It's controlled by something else. This is the exposure triangle. Has anyone ever seen this before? It's a very, very good visualization of why exposure is important and how to understand it. You have three different sides of this exposure triangle. Top left over there, shutter speed. Right side, aperture. Bottom, ISO. Three different things that we need to understand if we're going to take a good image. First thing that we need to understand, and actually I've just gone through all these things, shutter speed, ISO, and aperture. Shutter speed is the device that allows light to pass to the image sensor to permanently capture the image of a scene. What does that mean? The shutter is a device that opens and closes, okay? It is a device that cuts off and opens, closes and opens, therefore allowing light to not pass, and allowing light to pass. This is how our images are created. A fast shutter speed closes and opens really quickly. A slow shutter speed leaves it open for a very long time, okay? The shutter speed length of time determines how fast an image is allowed to collect, 
okay? The faster the shutter speed, the clearer an object in motion will be. So if our shutter is moving quickly, it is capturing an image by taking light in and cutting it off very quickly, okay? What's that going to do to our image? We're gonna be able to capture an image much, much quicker and we're gonna be able to capture an image in motion much quicker. And I'll show you some examples here in a couple of minutes about how that works. Alternately, less light will be allowed in and the image will be less bright. If you have a fast shutter speed, it doesn't allow as much light in. Therefore, it does only has a certain amount of time to collect that light. Therefore, it's not collecting as much and it won't be as bright, okay? When it comes to shutter, we will talk as we get more in detail about using the camera, what these fractions up here with the second mean, those are shutter speeds, and that's how our shutter speed is measured. But we'll get into that more at a later time. This is a slow shutter, and this is a fast shutter. Slow, the runner is blurry. Fast, you're catching that runner's movements, okay? Another aspect to know, another thing to know about shutter speed is the more blurred, the slower the shutter, the more blurred the object will be. This is just rehitting what we talked about a second ago. So a comparison on shutter speed. Here are two different photos, same picture, taken with different shutter speeds. Can someone tell me which of these pictures, left or right, is the fast or faster shutter speed? The one on the left. Why? Because this one over here, you've got all this blur. So the grass is blowing in the wind. It's had more time to expose this image. Therefore, watching the grass go from here to here and recording all of it, therefore making it look a little bit more blurry. And that's why the water looks a little bit more blurry because it's constantly in motion. And with the shutter open for a period of time, it collects all of that motion, therefore not being able to identify the individual pieces of that image. Aperture, second part of our exposure triangle. Aperture is the entrance pupil of the lens. So the aperture is a part that controls, not allows the light in or out, but controls the amount of light into the camera. It is measured in what we call f-stops, and that is the diameter of the aperture when it is opened. Here is a really good representation on the left for different f-stops. You see at the very top you have f1. That f1 is a wide open shutter, or wide open aperture, excuse me. That aperture is completely open and the image is completely as exposed as it can be in that aperture. The very bottom, you see that little bitty tiny hole in the middle, the yellow? That's f16. That is a very, very small aperture. That is a aperture that's not letting a large amount of light in. And you can see that the 1.4, I've missed the actual 0.4 up there. It disappeared when I was copying some things. So it is supposed to be 1.4. That is the wider opening of the aperture. And a larger f-stop will give you a shorter depth of field. And we will talk about depth of field a little bit more later. A smaller example of an f-stop would be f-16. And you can see that in the bottom right. And a small f-stop will give you a larger depth of field. Okay, and again, we will talk about depth of field a little bit more later. It is a really important concept when talking about photography because you want to be able to collect the depth of field that you are looking for. And it depends on what, um, what, your, what, what your image is supposed to look like and what you want the uh, final product of your image to look like. And that will depend on what your depth of field and what you are shooting for. The bottom of the exposure triangle is dedicated to ISO. ISO is the setting of the sensitivity of the image sensor, okay? The image sensor is the part at the back of the camera, right there where the lens meets the camera, that is collecting the light. Remember we saw that further or earlier on. It is the part of the camera that the shutter allows the 
the light to hit. The image sensor is what permanently collects the light in order to create an image. And the ISO is the sensitivity of that sensor. The more ISO you use, the more noise you will see in the image. And we'll give you an example right here. And the example is on the left, you have a clean image with no noise. That is at ISO 100. That is a very, very bottom level ISO. That is not very sensitive. That's just taking whatever light is there and not trying to make it more sensitive inside the camera. 3200 ISO is up in the sensitivity on the image sensor quite a bit. And you can see because of the amount of, no of, of light that it's trying to collect, it is also collecting a lot of noise into that image. This is something that you want to avoid. And as we get further into our lessons on photography, you will begin to understand why ISO is so important. Now the value of a higher ISO, okay, the value of using ISO is back down there at ISO 100, you can't see that rainbow very well. You can see it a little bit, but you can't see anything else around it, right? And as you move up to the ISO wheel, adding more sensitivity to our image sensor, we see how that image changes by adding light to the entire image and allowing that sensor to be more sensitive and collect more light. It is important for us to understand how and why this works so we can collect a good image. Now, how do these three elements relate to one another? Striking a balance between these three images is key. You have to be able to understand when you raise the ISO, you have to lower the aperture. Or when you raise the aperture, if your image is too bright, you either have to lower the ISO or raise the shutter speed. The three elements work in conjunction with one another in order to create a good image. And we will start practicing with that when we get our hands on the cameras um, in a couple of days. Adjusting any of these elements will affect the amount of light and brightness of your image, as we just talked about. For the best results, you want to choose the lowest ISO setting that gives you the cleanest image at an acceptable brightness level. Remember what we saw um, in the image with the noise? If we add 3200 to our ISO, we're going to get a little bit of noise. So we have to figure out a way to compensate for that. And that might be up in the aperture. It might be lowering the shutter speed, putting it on a tripod to keep the shot static while we have it, uh, while we have the shutter speed lower. It could be a number of things that we want to try. And we'll talk about how to do those things again. What's next? As we move through our introduction to photography topics. I want you all to, to try to imagine what all of these elements will mean when they are tied together and when they are used to create an image with the camera. We are going to be using cameras and we're going to be putting our hands onto a DSLR camera and we're going to be learning how to take good images in this class. And in order to do that, having a foundational understanding of the base principles of photography is crucial. And it is key. And I want you all to understand these principles so when it's time to take pictures and it's time to get our hands on the camera, you have a little bit of an understanding about how this stuff works. I don't want to stand up here and lecture you, and I'm not going to do that. This is a rare time for me. Most of the time we're working on hands-on projects. But understanding the theory so we can put that theory into practical application is important. Okay? Any questions at this point? I know we've been through a lot of information. Any questions? Okay. What's next? Fill out your Google Notes. Okay? I am going to ask you to fill out these note, note sheets for every lecture and every theoretical um, class period that we have. 
The reason I'm doing this is I want you to be able to understand this knowledge. I'm not about trying to trick you with a question on a quiz. I want you to see this information and to grasp this information. If there is something that you do not understand, please, please, please come talk to me after class. Come talk to me during study hall, after school, whatever you need to do. I want you to understand this material. And if you don't, please let me know. Your Google Notes pages will be due on Friday. Turn those in to me via Google. I will collect those and give you a grade for turning those in or not, okay? A photography terms quiz on Monday. We will have a quiz. Now, use the PowerPoint if you need to to create your notes. Whatever notes you took today, that's great. Use the PowerPoint to fill in the gaps if you need to. We will be having a quiz on Monday, okay? I do expect you all to at least have some sort of an understanding as to these terms so you can recall them later. When I say exposure, what does that mean? Or aperture, why do you need more of that? Or shutter speed, raise that or lower that. If you don't understand these terms, then you're not going to know why. These are the things we need to understand at the foundational and fundamental level in order to move through taking a picture, okay? And then next class, we are going to talk about a few more foundational principles and those foundational principles are color, focus, and composition. Color and focus are a lot of fun and composition is probably the most fun that I think we can have. And I'm really looking forward to doing those with you. And hopefully, um, yeah, that's it. Any questions? Completely got stumped and forgot what I was going to say, but that's okay. Any questions at all about what we talked about today? Yes, no, 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 all right. Thank you all very much. Um, please pack up everything, log off of your computers, sign out of anything that you are signed into, log out of the computers. Please leave them ready for the next class that comes because I do have a class again right after you walk out this door. So please make sure that they are ready. And before you leave, please push your chairs under the table. Are there any questions? Please do not leave this class today without having asked a question. We have about 90 seconds left in class, so if there are any questions, please let me know. No? Well, if there are no questions about what we talked about today, who's ready to get their hands on a camera? Yes, I know I am. I'm ready for you to get your hands on a camera. I love teaching photography, and I love getting to the point where we're taking pictures because taking pictures is a lot of fun. I have a lot of projects that we can do that are going to, what I hope, challenge you and also really make you enjoy photography and really get you interested in taking pictures. And I think a lot of those, um, a lot of those projects are gonna be fun. Actually, I know all of them are gonna be fun, but I hope each and every one of you get something out of all of them because to me, they are, they're pivotal in creating a knowledge and a foundational understanding um, for taking good pictures and being a photographer. Does anybody in here want to be a photographer when they graduate or when they go after they get out of school? Anybody do any photography outside of taking pictures with your phone? <laughs> no? Well, that's okay because I... I hope to at least make photographers out of one or two of you. Um, I know I wasn't a still photographer. I was always into video and, uh, and film, but uh, photography is one of the things, is one of my passions at this point, and I absolutely love it and can't wait to share that passion with you all.